Hello everyone, this is Jonathan Little for FloatTheTurn.com, and today I'm going to be going over a few non-standard sit-and-goes I've played over the last year or so. Um, the first two are going to be hyper-turbo sit-and-goes on Poker Stars, where you start with very few chips, and the blinds go up very quickly. I am unsure if they still run these, I assume they do, because I think they're really popular. But um, right before events would start, like say the Sunday Million's about to start, um, maybe... 30 minutes before, an hour before, they'd start running these, and everyone would put up, I believe this one was to get into a, I want to say a $2,000 event. The buy-in, I believe, was like 500 or something like that. So first place would get a buy-in, second place would get like two buy-ins back. I, I say a buy-in, a buy-in would be uh, $2,000. Second place would get $1,000, which would be about two actual buy-ins, and everyone else would get nothing. So... There's certainly value in playing for winning in these, but they're basically the same payout structure as the standard 6-max sit-and-go, although some of them certainly are different. You need to push pretty wide in these, but a lot of players also expect you to push pretty wide in these, and because of that, you don't need to go nuts. I mean, obviously everyone only has 10 big blinds, or really even like 5 effective big blinds, because if the big blind is actually 90, we're sitting at you know 500 chips, so we have 4.5 big blinds. So we're very short stack, but everyone knows we're very short stack. So your edge in these is going to come from pushing the bubble around well lately, and not so much from getting it in early and gambling. Um, so right here we get we get a coin flip, and this is just a pretty standard spot. Any pair you're going to be shoving from any position in these, if it's folded to you. I don't, I don't really think that's debatable whatsoever. Um, but you really don't want to go broke in the early level, or the very very beginning, because that really just squanders your opportunity to get in the money. So you don't really want a coin flip, but obviously we're going to jam ace king or jam threes, and he's going to call with ace king every time. So we chop it up like it should be on coin flips. Here, king seven shoves. I believe that's pretty standard as well. If they folded to me right here, I would go ahead and shove the 5-4. Whenever you're in the small blind, you really need to shove an extraordinarily wide range. People are going to fold way too often. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this or not. This is from a $500 game, so I think I did, now that I said $500. Notice here that George, who is a, a regular, is just open shoving, even though it looks like it's 20 big blinds. It's actually only, like, you know, the effective stack, which is 500 chips, so only... Five big blinds, or ten big blinds, sorry. If they folded to me here, I would shove this ace four, but there's a shove in front of me, so I just fold. Right here with king queen, I don't think we can ever fold this. If it would like shove call, I would still just call off. We're very short now, I notice the antes are huge as well. So. Whenever you're getting good odds and you have a good hand, you just have to call off. And we are going to be behind ace a lot of the time if there's like a shove and a call, but that's okay because we have a pretty good hand. Uh, and right here we have a very easy call, like a no-brainer. Here's another very standard situation. We get ace-king, and if we're not folding king-queen, we're certainly not folding ace-king. So pretty easy call here. And we win that as well. All right, so now we are three-handed. Uh, this is an interesting spot because notice the big blind is very short. I don't think he's going to fold too often, so when I shove here, I know I'm going to get called a decent amount of the time, but that doesn't really matter that much. Um, I'm more so, if he's ever going to fold, it's just a huge success for me. So I'm going to go ahead and shove here, not necessarily with a super wide range, but with, certainly with decent hands, and queen nine is definitely decent enough. And as you see, Stevie apparently knows what he's doing, so he calls off with 10-6. I think that's a fine call. There's no point in him folding. Now heads up, we're just playing a very standard short stack shove game. I'm going to be shoving a lot of hands from the small blind. Um, I think I should probably shove the 7-2 suited, seeing how he's folded every hand so far. I do shove the 10-5 suited, and he pushes ace-9. It's going to be a very easy call. And we win 2000 bucks in about 5 minutes. Actually, we only won uh, 1500 there, but that's okay. Here is from a $43 event. Same same game, um, different players. I believe this one's to get in the Sunday Million. 
And, uh, you know, in these, now that I think about it more, I think maybe first place is the buy-in to the event, and f second place maybe just one buy-in back. Or maybe a touch more than one buy-in, so you really are playing for first in these, if that's the case. This is a pretty standard shove spot here, with the eighth, king, ten, and eighth track. Right here, if this player went all in for 15 chips and it got folded to me, I would jam here with the 10-8 suited. It's almost like this 15-chip player isn't even here. Uh, of course, it is important because I'm only going to be picking up, uh, what, 45 chips. So I'm I'm going to, when I sub here, I'm, stu I'm stealing 14, 45 chips instead of the pot, which is normally 135. But our hand's pretty good, so it's not that big of a deal. But, of course, when this guy shoves, I have a very easy fold. This is a spot where I am not entirely sure what to do. If you guys ha if you guys know the correct answer to this, without a doubt, I would love for you to let me know. Um, with small pairs here, I think it's probably plus EV to avoid these coin flippish type spots. If I had something like sixes, I would definitely call. Fives would be close, but I think threes, twos, and fours are probably folds in this spot. You're going to find that against this guy's range, you're not in great shape. So, you're probably best off just folding, which is what I do. Here he just opens to two and a half big blinds. I have no clue what this means, but I have ace-queen, so it doesn't really matter. I'm going to rip it in and be very happy. And he does it with king-7 suited, so... <sighs> A little bit bizarre. I don't really know why he would raise here. Once he raises, of course, he has to call off, but I think you're best off just folding king-7 suited under the gun, five-handed. Maybe he got some chips and thought that was a great spot or something. Here's another spot very similar to the pocket three hand where I think this is close, but still just a fold. And even though we, we only need to win like 42% of the time, and we're probably going to win a little bit more than that, it's still probably best just to get out of the way. We have a decent amount of chips and can probably bully this tall goose player around at least for a little bit. So I'm just going to sit back, conserve my chips, and push in spots that are good for me. Now right here we have ace-3, but this is a little bit of a different situation because we have a short stack shoving, and he has no chips. So when this guy shoves, he just has a super wide open range, and if I, if I shove here, I'm going to isolate uh, him a lot of the time, and that's a very good thing. So I think this is a pretty easy shove. We get called by ace-7, which sucks. <laughs> that's not what you want. And he wins a pile of chips. So now we are down to no chips. And right here I'm going to be shoving a pretty good amount. Obviously ace-9 is good enough to shove. We get a walk here. If if this small blind... Actually, if either player shoved, I would just call off with the ace-2 here. At this point, we are so short to where we just have to go with anything. Same thing right here. If they fold to me, I'm going to be jamming any two cards. And you do see that he folds, so we do have fold equity. I like to fold queen eight, and I don't really like this fold in a vacuum, but seeing how I have played like every hand for the last four hands, I think we probably need to lay off just a little bit, so I do like to fold. And right here, I'm fairly surprised on this hand that Tall Goose does not shove. This is a pretty easy shove spot with 100% of hands in his situation. We keep getting walks, which is excellent. Very easy shove with Jack. Jack. And now we're just going to get in the money. So, heads up again. Um, I'm going to be shoving pretty wide from the small blind, as you see here. Even though he is fairly short, it doesn't really matter. He's still going to fold sometimes. And Notice whenever he folds, I pick up 380 chips. And that may not sound like a lot, but notice that there are only, what, 3,000 chips in play? So we're picking up like a twelfth of the chips in play every time we shove. It's a pretty big success just to seal the blinds. Right here he shoves. Again, I don't really like calling off the small pairs, but right here I only need to win 35% of the time, and twos are going to win well more than that, so pretty easy call spot. And we win. Let's find this double or nothing game I have over here. 
So now this is totally switching gears and going from trying to win the tournament, now we are going to try to just get in the money. And in these double or nothing sit and goes, in the money is the top five places. Let me see how big of a buy-in this is. A uh, $100, $100 game, so fairly high stakes game, but that doesn't matter too much. Very first hand. <laughs> Uh, there's a limp. I raise it up with kings, which I think is pretty standard. A lot of guys will limp with small pairs in these tournaments, and you really don't want to like limp behind or even make a tiny raise here with kings because you want to give them very poor implied odds right off the bat. And by raising to 100 here, we are giving him very bad odds. Now, this player here raises to 400, and I think this is an atrocious raise size because he has to have a hand here, and if he has to have a hand... I can play perfectly. So if I had something like pocket jacks here, I would just fold the hand very easily. If I had queens, I guess I would go with it. If I had ace-king, I think I would just fold. So I guess really my range to go here is queens and better. And I know that sounds very tight, but in these tournaments, you don't really have to do too much to get in the money. All you have to do is last. And you don't want to go broke early on a coin flip. Obviously, kings are not going to be a coin flip here. So we're, of course, going to jam it in. He's going to call with, like, whatever he has. Of course, he has a good hand. He has, like, ace-king... Aces, kings, queens, or jacks, I think, a lot of the time. And kings does very good against that range. And by the time he puts in 400 chips, he just has to call off with all of it. So, I think he messed up pretty badly here. If I was in his shoes with queens here, I would just call and take a flop. I know that sounds a little bit dicey, but you really do not want to go broke early in these tournaments. Here I like to limp with ace-9 suited. This is probably a little bit loose. I could justify a fold here. Here I call the flop with top pair. We get raised, so I just fold. Um, once you double up in these events, there's really not a whole lot of value in playing hands because you're not necessarily locked to get in the money, but you're certainly not in bad shape to get in the money. So for that reason, I, I, I don't know. I think calling, calling pre-flop and calling the flop is fine, but once people start applying pressure, you just need to get out of the way. Like right here, queen nine suited, I'm just going to fold this every time. Whereas if this was like a multi-table tournament or a 180-person sit and go, I'd raise it every time. But here, I just have to outlast four more guys to double my money. So I'm going to play very tight. And believe it or not, I used to be like the king of tight playing. <laughs> um, I remember a long time ago watching poker on TV, and there was a guy, David Gray, who was sort of like a seven-card stud player. But everyone said he's always the tightest player, but he's... One of the biggest winners, and I remember thinking, wow, that's cool. I want to play tight and be a big winner, too. But as I've grown as a poker player, I realize that is not how you win, and it's it's not a good strategy. Playing tight is not good in general, but if the structure suggests you play tight, you really do need to play tight. For example, if you're playing in a 10-handed game and nine people get money, as in one person's buy and goes to everyone else, so say it's a $100 game, if you get in the money, everyone gets 10 bucks profit, you should play very tight because there's no value in going broke ever. Uh, five handed is a little bit different, or where, where five people get paid is a little bit different. And certainly, whenever one person gets paid, which is sort of the case in big multi-table tournaments where like one or two percent of the field get a lot of the money, you need to play like a maniac. So <sighs> here we're going to be very tight. Right here, I limp with king two suited, and I don't like this. I think I should probably just fold. If you guys do want to learn more about double or nothing sit and goes. Videos by Jason Kobe on the site are very good. He is a master at the game, one of the biggest winners. So check those out. Right here, I raise it up with ace nine. I would prefer a raise to seventy five here. I think that would accomplish the same thing. Whenever you have a big stack, it is a touch easier to maintain a big stack in these events because everyone else plays fairly tight. Um, like this king nine suited, I'm I'm just never going to open this, but you could consider it, and I don't think it would be terrible, but you're almost certainly better off just folding. Here, everyone gives me a walk. One thing they do in these double or nothing sit and goes is they throw in antis, and I think that's very good. It, it does loosen up the play a little bit, otherwise you know, you'd be here a ex whole extra level or two. So antis do come in early, and that does mean you should start stealing earlier, but it doesn't mean you should go crazy. Here I raise it up to three big blinds with jacks. And I, I don't like my raise size again. I'd much prefer a raise to 125. 
we get jammed on, and we need to win 43% of the time to break even, according to uh, chip EV, but dollar EV-wise, we need to win more like 55 or 60% of the time. So let me pull up Poker Stove real quick, and we'll try to figure out what our equity is here. If we assume this guy is shoving any sort of reasonable range, I think he's going to be shoving something like this. I think this looks pretty reasonable. Uh, and it's probably tighter than most people are going to be shoving. You'll see against this range we have 60% equity. And like I said, we need to win maybe like 60% of the time. So this is close, but I still think it's a pretty easy call with jacks. If we had 10s, then it gets a little bit closer. I'll show you. So now we have 55% equity. But honestly, this guy's range is probably even wider than what I have typed in here. It's probably more something like this. And against this range, you'll see that we're in pretty good shape. Even with pocket 10s, we're in pretty good shape. If I had ace-king, I'd call as well. So you see all those hands are pretty fantastic right here. So no-brainer call with jacks. He does happen to have ace-queen, so it makes me wonder if this loose range is correct. If we make his range fairly tight, something like this, we'll see that... Um, let's check out ace-king first. It's still going to be a call, I think. Jacks are going to be a little bit closer as well. But again, there's still probably calls. So now that we have 4,500 chips, I am not going to be looking to mess around too much at all. Here I raise it up again. I would prefer a raise to about 125. That would accomplish the same thing. A continuation bet and get called. Check, check the turn. I check the river and he half pots it. <sighs> I mean, I don't I don't know what to do here. I think this is a tough spot. If this was a multi-table tournament, I'd be really tilted towards calling. But since this is a double or nothing game, and I have plenty of chips, I'm just going to fold. Because there's no real reason to put my money in in a very marginal spot. Okay, I hate this. I think this is actually a very big error. And I'm disappointed this isn't a video. Um, this guy jams, and I assume he's jamming pretty wide, but, and I call a King Jack suit, but this is a terrible call, and I'll show you why. I'm glad this was from like a year ago, so it's not like yesterday, I'd be embarrassed. Um, let's just, let's say shoving something reasonable. Let's say he's shoving these hands, which I think is probably going to be about right. Against this hand, this range, we only have 45% equity. And in order to call here, we need to win 43% of the time to break even for chip EV. But again, we're talking about dollar EV here, and we really need to have a lot more dollar EV than chip EV here. So while it may be a tiny, tiny, tiny bit plus EV to call, plus chip EV to call, it's going to be very negative dollar EV. So right here is just lighting money on fire. Especially given that, given the structure, we are almost guaranteed to get in the money. Uh, so that was a that was a pretty bad call. Now we're really guaranteed to get in the money. This guy half stacks it under the gun. I think this is almost always a weak play, with a hand that he's just trying to steal the pot with. Something like, maybe ace queen, ace jack, maybe something like tens, nines, eights, and against that range, we are in very good shape. <sighs> However. Going back to what I just said, we are almost guaranteed to get in the money. Notice there are seven people left, and we have a whole lot of chips. I don't need to play here. I need to just fold. Uh, there's really no v reason to give away 1,500 chips, even if we know that his range is in pretty bad shape. Actually, let's, let's go over here and see how we're doing against that range I said. If he has one of these hands that I think are in pretty bad shape, like this... You'll see that jacks have 65% equity, which is quite a bit. However, again, there's always a however. We have to fade these three guys behind us. If any of them have a hand, that's bad for me. And even then, it's not like a great situation, because I want to be very a very high percentage to win any hand I play from here on, because if I just blind off, I'm going to get in the money. So there's no reason to play here. This is a fairly big mistake, too, I think. And he does have one of those hands that I thought was squarely in his range. You see ace-queen. These are hands that he doesn't really want to raise and get shoved on, so he just decides to put in his whole stack and see what happens. 
and the bad thing for me happened. However, we still have a lot of chips, so I'm not going to do anything crazy. I'm just going to play fairly tight and try to sneak in the money. Right here with 7 6 suited, I'm just going to fold. Notice there are one, two players that are both getting relatively short. They both have a thousand chips or so. And if I just sit here and fold, I'm going to get in the money. So that's what I'm going to do. Here they fold to me, and I like to just go all in. And. I think this is too risky. If this player had like 2,000 chips or less, then I think that this would be a perfectly fine shove. But given that he has 3,000 chips, uh, I don't know. I, I think this is probably just an easy fold. So right here, there's always some value in calling here, because if you call, everyone else will call, and you you could easily get in the money. And that's assuming this guy has, like, 400 chips or 500 chips. I'm not going to call with Jack-2 ever, but say I had, like, Jack-10 suited here, and he had 500 chips, I would just call. And then that will start a chain of calls, and then we're almost all certain to get in the money. So that's something that you'll see happen quite frequently in these. This player continues shoving, and I don't know what he has here, but he, I think he actually needs a pretty good hand to jam here, because this player here is getting very short as well, and at this point you can, again, just try it out last your opponent. And he has pocket nines, which I think is pretty good. This king-10 call I think is very bad, because king-10's in pretty bad shape against a fairly tight range. But that doesn't stop him, he gets it in, peels a 10, and wins. So, that's all I have for today. If you guys have any questions about these non-standard sit-and-goes or any other format you'd like to see covered, please let me know, and I'll try to find someone to play some games and make that happen. This has been Jonathan Little for FloatTheTurn.com.